Today's episode was sponsored by SK Era. Sorry, this is a very big patch. I made it a little bigger than normal, but hey, there it is. SK Era, thank you so much, and let's go ahead and get this bad boy up on the wall, shall we? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, there it is, up on the quilt, L looking real long. And actually, you know what? I'm saying SK Era sponsored the episode, but I should clarify something. It was actually SK Era's sister who sponsored the episode on behalf of SK Era. So if, 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 you're, if you're SK Era watching this feeling really confused, wondering when you sponsored an episode, there, there, there's a reason for that. You, di you, you didn't, so. I asked your sister if she had any special message she wanted me to say, and she did, so here it goes. Uh, congratulations to SK Era on publishing her first fantasy book, The Fox and the Dragon. And next time your sister asks you what she can do to support you, don't jokingly say advertising without any further instructions. Good advice, although I like to think that it worked out, so. Which, yeah, SK Era actually just published a book, which is so cool. Uh, it's called The Fox and the Dragon, and it sounds awesome. A shrine maiden blessed by the gods, Shen's life is devoted to banishing the dark spirits and demons that plague the war-torn lands. A life she's stolen from when the Anui abduct her. Forced to marry their barbarian lord and held captive in hostile land, Shen must conceal she possesses an unearthly power. One her people have wielded against the Anui in their ruthless war that will get her killed or worse if she's discovered. For Shen, to survive, she must master a part of her that she cannot yet control and cannot hide for long. And believe it or not, that's only half of the synopsis. I just don't trust myself to read any longer than about a paragraph. So if you want to know more about the book, then check out the link in the description below where you can read the rest of the synopsis and buy the book which you should do, because it sounds like a great read. And yeah, truly from the bottom of my heart, thank you SK Era and SK Era's sister. Your support really helps the channel and I really appreciate it. And with that out of the way, let's go ahead and start the episode. Hello Nitwits and welcome to Knitting Time with Willie. I'm your host, Willie Muse, joined as always by my co-host, Nitkalis. And recently, I've been watching a lot of the TV show Bones. I'm not, not, not entirely sure why. But yeah, after watching just about every episode in existence, I've come to the conclusion that Bones is the craziest TV show ever made. And that gave me an idea for a brand new series of videos I want to make, which I am calling... Bones is the craziest TV show ever made. So for those of you who don't know, Bones follows Temperance Brennan, aka Bones, a world-renowned forensic anthropologist who solves crimes by studying... well, Bones. Uh, that, that, that's why she's called Bones. I, 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 I'm going to be saying bones a lot in this video, so buckle up. And yeah, well, I guess on paper that description doesn't sound all that remarkable. Bones really stretches its premise to the absolute limit, and the end result is both consistently bizarre and also weirdly riveting. I truly believe that I could pick any random episode of Bones and talk about it for about an hour or so, and... So yeah, that's what I'm going to do. I spent the past few weeks in my laboratory constructing a device which will randomly select one of the episodes from the show's 12 season tenure, and I will be making a video about whatever episode it chooses for me. So let me just grab that now. Um, here it is. Got to turn it on first. I apologize. It's a little bit loud, but um, it's a very advanced piece of machinery. So. That's to be expected. But uh yeah, let's see what episode it chooses. Yeah. Boop, 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 boop. 
All right, so it looks like I'm going to be talking about Season 4, Episode 8. Cool. So yeah, I'm going to go watch that episode, and then I'm going to come back here and talk about it. Uh, hopefully there's enough to talk about. Okay, there is more than enough to talk about. This is Season 4, Episode 8 of Bones, The Skull and the Sculpture. As with every episode of Bones, we open by establishing the case of the week by showing a short sequence of two otherwise unrelated people discovering a body. This time around, those people are a couple of drunk, goofy kids who are sneaking into a junkyard to try and steal some old car parts. My dad thinks I'm selfish. Someone steals steal him some spare parts for his birthday. They see a crushed car cube with a sick-ass gold side mirror, and when one of them goes to take it off, he ends up finding a lot more than he expected. Gotta be gentle. It's coming. <laughs> the car is bleeding. And I feel like this is actually a pretty good encapsulation of what the show is like. The tone of it is generally pretty light and airy, but the premise of it means that peppered in between all of that light and airy stuff is some of the absolute most gruesome shit you've ever seen in your life. Bones is, after all, about... Bones. So it's not like they can just have a protagonist studying some run of the mill everyday skeleton. For Bones to be worthy of Bones, they need to be remarkable in some way. And so that meant that every single week, the writers had to come up with new and interesting ways to mangle a corpse. And it's actually extremely ghoulish when you stop to think about it for longer than two seconds. This week, for example, a person is crushed to death by a car crusher, which when you stop to consider the human element of what that would entail is absolutely unfathomable. Uh, like truly one of the worst tragedies I could possibly imagine. Thankfully though, the show doesn't really consider the human element ever. It very rarely sees the maimed and rotting dead people it presents at the beginning of an episode as anything more than objects at the center of a mystery. And Honestly, I think that's probably for the best, because if they actually treated the subject matter with a modicum of the respect it deserves, they would not be able to segue so seamlessly into the next scene, which is largely played for laughs. The scene in question is a conversation between two of Bones' co-workers, and were it to happen in real life, I don't think it would technically be legal. Okay, look, just to be clear, I asked you out for a drink to talk, not because I'm desperate for male company. You just got divorced and broke up with your fiance. It's totally understandable that you don't feel like sex. I feel like sex. You know, like how you talk to your coworkers. I don't know if we ever meet the HR person in the Bones office, and that might very well be because there just isn't one. Although if there is, they are terrible at their job because all of these people should have been fired seasons ago at this point. Bones is a workplace drama, and for those to work narratively, the most important people in all of these characters' lives end up being their co-workers, which means that all sorts of lines casually end up being blurred in all sorts of inappropriate ways. Here, for example, this lady has asked a dude from work out to a bar to discuss how she'd like to get railed. I feel like sex. Oh. Sex is what I feel like. Now, I could jump Hodgins, but it doesn't seem fair somehow. Do you agree? Hodgins, for those curious, is also their co-worker. He's also that woman's ex-fiance. So. Her name is Angela Pearly Gates Montenegro, and she's the facial reconstructionist in the Bones Lab. She, she, she's also Bones' best friend, because these people don't have lives outside of work. 
She's kind of meant to be a hippie-ish, free-spirited foil to Bones because she's the one artist in a room full of scientists. Although I would also argue that as the show progresses, she proves herself to be easily the most impressive scientific mind of anyone in the lab. They kind of used her in the same way that movies in the 2000s used hackers. She can basically do anything that's needed to move the plot along, and so that means that at least once an episode, she ends up casually doing something that realistically should earn her a Nobel Prize. Still, despite having a scientific acumen that borders on witchcraft, the show very much wants us to view her as the bohemian flower child of the group, which is why they frequently depict her as saying shit like this with reckless abandon. It's been like six weeks. That's a, a long time. Yes, of course it is. The longest I've gone without since I lost my virginity at age 16, mm. which is the normal age. Sometimes older is just fine too. And listening to that string of words that just left her mouth, it might be easy for you to assume that Angela is the more inappropriate one in this situation, but I would honestly argue that the guy she's talking to is crossing way more lines right now than she is. His name is Lance Sweets, and I'm not sure, but I think he might be one of the more ethically ambiguous characters of any show that I've ever seen. Like everyone else on Bones, he maintains some very inappropriate relationships with his co-workers, but where he takes things a little bit further is that he's also a therapist to many of them. I think. I'll be honest and say that I'm not 100% certain what his job is. Like, I know that he's a mental health professional who works at the same place as Bones, but I don't know if his primary duty there is to psychologically profile the murderers during an investigation or to treat the people in the office, because... Well, he does both. Honestly, I kind of hope it's the latter, because I don't know that he's a particularly strong profiler. He uses a lot of pop science that even I, as a person whose knowledge of psychology begins and ends with watching old episodes of Frasier, no, is not particularly valid. Like, he'll come into a case and say shit like, you know, Freud would argue that the gun represents his penis, and in killing this woman, he may have been redirecting Oedipal rage he meant for his mother, and it's like... Okay, I guess maybe that's a fun tidbit to share at a dinner party, but... I don't know, I'm not entirely sure how useful it is in this murder investigation. Still, if his main job is to provide therapy to his co-workers, then I'd say he's not really doing such a great job at that either, because he does not seem to have any sort of boundaries in place. Like, I can't say for sure everyone who's been his patient over the course of the series, but one person he's for sure treated as Bones herself, and at one point he just straight up lives in her house, which... Yeah, I'm pretty sure a therapist isn't supposed to do that. And while I am, again, no expert in psychology, I feel like were you to ask most psychologists if it's a good idea to meet your coworker who's also your patient's best friend at a bar after hours and give her off-the-record advice about her sex life, most of them would probably say no. That said, though, this is Bones, so Sweets does it anyway, and it eventually leads to Angela deciding that she needs to get back out there after ending her engagement, which, outside of the murder mystery, is sort of the main storyline of this episode. After that scene at the bar, we finally head over to the Jeffersonian, the fake version of the Smithsonian where the majority of this show is set. And Lest you think that I was being hyperbolic before when I said that this show casually peppers in some of the most gruesome shit that you've ever seen in your life, just know that this is the actual transition that they use. To love, huh? Enjoy. And sex. <laughs> Standing around that gloopy pile of human remains is more of this show's colorful cast of characters, and like, I could probably rant for the length of an episode about every last one of them, but 
I'm gonna hold off on doing that for now and instead just give you the SparkNotes version. So from right to left, you have Angela, who I've already talked about, and then next to her is Hodgins, Angela's ex-fiance, who she mentioned in the last scene. He's like a bug expert, I guess. He helps Bones solve her mysteries by studying the insects on the corpses they find, and he's also a billionaire for some reason. Or at least I think he's still a billionaire here. At some point in the series, he gives away his family's entire fortune to stop a hacker from drone striking a school in Afghanistan. I, I feel like that's post-season six, though. Like I said earlier, Angela and Hodgins have an on-again, off-again relationship which is currently off. And like I also said earlier, a lot of this episode focuses on Angela trying to move on. Hey, have you been seeing anybody? So I, I don't want to be rude, but I just don't think that's any of your business. I haven't. Me either. <laughs> But I'm gonna start. Right, yeah, me too. I mean, like, right away. Okay, if all that happened in this scene was that she told her ex-fiance that she was planning on dating again at their shared place of business in front of all of their co-workers, that would already be one of the most inappropriate things that I've ever seen in my life. But the fact that she also does it in the same room as the rotting corpse of a murder victim makes it infinitely worse. Next to Hodgins, you have Daisy, who is one of the lab's many interns. From seasons one to three, Bones had an assistant named Zack, but then it turned out that he was secretly a serial killer's apprentice, so he went to jail and was then replaced by a rotating roster of supporting characters. And this is actually a pretty fun gimmick that the show has. Each intern only pops up every few episodes, and they each have a fun little quirk that gives them their own unique identity. You have Clark, who's a know-it-all, Colin, who's creepy, and Vincent Nigel Murray, who's British and really into trivia for some reason. And then, of course, you have Daisy, and her thing is kind of just that everyone hates her. Uh, like, everyone in the lab openly talks shit about her to her face in a way that feels kind of harsh to me sometimes. It seems that any viable examination pre-extraction is impossible. Unless somebody has x-ray vision. <laughs> I meant to warn you that Miss Wick came up in the rotation. And it's weird too, because I feel like she's not even that bad as far as the interns are concerned. I mean, she's obviously not the best, that's Wendell, but she's definitely not the worst either. I would say that objectively, British trivia dude is way more annoying than Daisy, but for whatever reason, the people in the lab don't feel the same. I guess just because he gets murdered by a sniper in season 6, that gives him a free pass. But yeah, Daisy's co-workers do not like her, and they treat her with a level of disdain that, like a lot of things on this show, feels like a very clear HR violation. Next to Daisy is Dr. Camille Soroyan, and... She is also there. I don't know, I like the character, but I honestly just don't have a lot to say about her. She's the person in charge of the lab, and her thing is basically just that she follows the rules, which... Yeah, not super interesting, though I will give her this, considering how frequently her employees break said rules, it does lead to a lot of drama over the course of the series. Also, she's probably the only main character who never commits a felony, so she's got that going for her. And finally, next to Dr. Soroyan is the titular Bones. She's obviously the star of the show, and if you were to ask me to describe her in one word, I'd either go with badass or autistic, because I feel like those are probably her two most defining characteristics. And like, before anyone goes getting mad at me in the comments, please know that normally I wouldn't diagnose a character like that because, well, as previously stated, I'm not an expert in psychology, but I feel like if anyone should understand assuming that the people and the things they watch are autistic, 
It's those of you who like my videos. So I figured that in this instance, it would be okay. Also, in my defense, she definitely is. It feels pretty undeniable. Although that said, I'm not entirely sure that the people writing this show know that she is. So that adds an interesting layer to everything. My theory with Bones is that the executives at Fox saw how popular Dr. House was and were like, cool, make me a lady one of those. But then they actually saw a female character who was smarter than everyone else and didn't care about their feelings and they realized like, well, that makes me not want to fuck her. Ooh, we, we can't have that. So then the writers tweaked her a little bit to make her house-like, but in a way that was more becoming of a girl. And then after a few rounds of tweaking, they ended up just accidentally inventing autism. I feel like there's also a chance that what they were going for here was adorkable. Like, she is, after all, played by Zoe Deschanel's sister Emily, so I think that Bones may have been, like, a gritty take on a manic pixie dream girl, but... Well, if that is what they were going for, then like all manic pixie dream girls, the end result is just a character who's neurodivergent. And honestly, I think that might be kinda cool. Like, I hesitate to say this given that I'm talking about a show from 2005, but I think that Bones might actually be an example of pretty good representation. Like I said earlier, she's kind of a badass. She's a world-famous scientist, a best-selling novelist, and she's easily the smartest person in every room that she's in. She's definitely treated as different, but in a way where that's just who she is. Her differences are never presented as a bad thing, and actually it's mostly because of them that she's as awesome as she is. In a lesser series, I feel like there probably would have been an episode where Bones breaks down over her inability to connect to people around her, but as far as I know, that never happens here. And like again, that may very well be because the people writing this just don't actually realize that she's autistic, but whatever, it makes for a better show regardless. And yeah, that's everyone in the scene. Outside of them, the only person you really need to know is Bones' partner and future husband, Celie Booth. Because even though the show is named after her, I feel like he's as much of a protagonist as Bones is. And Booth is kind of just like... Like a good old boy, you know? He's an FBI agent and he's smart, but... He's a more grounded, down-to-earth kind of smart than Bones is, so the two of them view situations they're in very differently, and they end up having a good chemistry because of it. And like, don't get me wrong, I like Booth, but whenever he's on screen, I can never shake the feeling that if he existed in real life, I would absolutely hate his guts. He's a deeply Catholic ex-military cop, so... While the show does a really good job at making him cool and relatable, I can't really imagine anyone who I personally would relate to less. Which is not to say that I could never be friends with a deeply Catholic ex-military cop, but I do feel like I know the sort of person they're going for here, and Booth is a very glossy Hollywood version of what that person actually entails. Uh, like what we see on the show is charming, but I feel like if there were a world where I could actually have a conversation with the guy, it wouldn't take long before that conversation turned into him ranting about cancel culture. If that makes sense. Booth calls Bones with a lead on where the car with the body in it originated from, and so Bones goes to meet him there. For reasons. She, she, she doesn't really have any field training, and nothing she does requires her to be on the scene immediately, but... Whatever. I guess they just enjoy spending time together. 
The invoice was made out to B&B Enterprises. This was the sixth car that was crushed and sent back to this address. Oh, so you think there might be five more bodies? Well, you know what? If this is mob-related and we bring down the big boys, we will yeah. sell the movie rights for a fortune. But what if it's not the mob? Come on, do the math. Well, the math wouldn't indicate motive or identify suspect, and you haven't even provided enough variables. It's a figure of speech, Bones, all right? And yeah, that right there is basically what 90% of this series is. Booth says something... Bones takes it too literally and doesn't understand it, and then Booth explains it to her. And, like, you'd think that they wouldn't be able to make that work for 12 seasons, but somehow they do. They get to the door of the building where the cars were being sent, and when they find out that it's locked, they promptly head to a judge to get a search warrant. <laughs> nah, I'm totally kidding. Give me some space, all right? Is that legal? Look, if anybody asks, the door was open. No, it isn't. Oh, right. Man, I miss the days when I could look at a cop breaking and entering and still think, yeah. I'm rooting for that guy. Things were so much simpler then. Booth uses the lock picking tools that he brought with him because this was all premeditated apparently, and together he and Bones go inside, where rather than finding the mafia, they find someone a little bit quirkier. Okay, what the hell are you supposed to be? Okay, I get that you think that she's a murderer, but that is still a very rude way to greet someone. Uh, it's bad enough that you broke into her property. You don't have to insult her appearance, too. And yeah, after the kimono lady enters, the credits roll. And this marks the moment that happens in almost every episode of Bones, where the plot does a major heel turn. The mysteries on this show very rarely end up anywhere near where they started out. Here, for example, we began in a junkyard, so we were led to believe that we'd be dealing with some blue-collar car-based mystery, but as it turns out, no. This is an episode all about the art world. You see, all of those cars that were getting crushed were actually being peddled as high-end sculptures, and so now on top of a mystery... The show is also going to treat us to about 30 or so minutes of discussions about the nature of art, all of which play out exactly like you'd expect from a primetime broadcast drama made in the 2000s. They, even if you've never seen an episode of this show, I feel like based solely on my short description of him, you could probably guess Booth's exact reaction to finding out that old cars were being sold as art. All cultures put a great value on art. Yeah, yeah. art. A nice bowl of fruit, well, uh, and dogs playing well, poker. If I sold all the crap that was in my garage, it's hard to explain. I could that retire. I'd, I'd make a fortune. So, while nothing that's said here is too groundbreaking, that's also not really the point of the show. But frankly, if you're coming to Bones looking for a deep philosophical treatise on the nature of art, then you're a weird person. This show is all about the mystery, and centering this episode around art does actually make things a lot more interesting in that regard. I've already called my lawyer. It's great. So I'm going to meet you down at the FBI office. Oh, I didn't call him for me. You see how much these works are worth. You are liable for any damages. And this is made even more complicated by the fact that the stuff around the murder might not be the only thing in this situation that belongs in a gallery. The murder itself might just be art as well. Uh, recently, Jeffrey's been talking about finding a way to make himself part of the art. Do you mean literally? The ultimate artistic act. Now, I'm no expert here, but learning that the artist whose sculpture has a mysterious body crush inside it used to talk about crushing his body inside one of his sculptures feels like a pretty big lead in the case. Now, not everyone feels the same way as I do, though, apparently. Do you think Jeffrey might have actually done it? No. That was all just depressed artist talk, Roxy. You should know that. 
You're a depressed artist yourself. Does she think that depressed artist talk never leads to anything worse? You'd think that a professional curator would have a better grasp on art history than that. Also, make a note of that woman whose face kimono lady is centrally caressing right now. She's the car artist's assistant, Roxy, and she'll become important later. Although probably not for the reasons you're expecting. We leave the art gallery and head back to the Jeffersonian, where Hodgins is on his way to tear into the crushed car sculpture so that Bones can better examine the skeleton inside it. That was a weird sentence. You know what this is? Jaws of life. 23,000 pounds per square inch of raw prying power. You really want to be the one to use that, don't you? It's not display sexual frustration. Jesus Christ, dude, that's your boss. This is a place of business. Unfortunately for Hodgins, before he can take out his sexual frustration on that sculpture slash murder scene, he's stopped by this lady. Sorry, Cherie. Apparently, this is an historic piece of art. It's a hard car shell with a gooey corpse filling. I've already collected textile tissue and bone samples. That was before I got here. Here on in, this is an historic piece of art. These fine people persuaded a judge of that and got a temporary injunction. She's kind of like Bones' as Gunther, you know? Like, not quite the main cast, but still definitely the most important second stringer on the show. Her job is to tell the Bones team what they can and can't do, and her thing is that she calls everyone Cherie. Not sure if they ever explain why she does that, but it's a fun detail nonetheless. She's appeared in literally every season, and if she has a name, I certainly never bothered to learn it, because it super doesn't matter. That said, she's without question my favorite character on the show. She tells the Bones team that Kimono Lady has gotten a temporary injunction to prevent them from doing any damage to the sculpture, so that means that until they can work things out with a judge, they can't really investigate any further. Or at least not legally. Obviously this is Bones, so they ignore the law by dumping a bunch of bugs onto the body. I was going to say that I had an accident over here, but I, I don't like lying. I'm not entirely sure how that helps out their investigation, though. I'm also not sure why Bones has easy access to a gigantic jar of beetles. Still, though Bones has little respect for the legal process, she respects it enough that she doesn't cut into the car, which means that they can't properly examine the body. For, for like a scene, and then it just kind of resolves itself. Accompanying my favorite character into the lab are the kimono lady and Roxy the assistant. And this is how we learn that Roxy and Angela used to date back in art school. Roxy? <laughs> Angie? <laughs> Roxy. Oh my God. What are you doing here? <laughs> What's going on? Those two are old friends from college, if that's the same Roxy. <laughs> like I said, Angela is the free-spirited wild child of the group, which of course means that she's a bisexual, which of course means that she dates one woman once for three episodes and then never again for the entirety of the series. And honestly, this is where the episode really starts to get fun for me. I think my favorite part about Bones is that they often try to weave political issues into their narratives in the most 2000s of ways. And I guess that this week, the issue at hand is just like the existence of bisexuals. This episode is very much a relic of its time. Although that said, I do kind of wish that it had been made just a couple of years earlier because I think we probably would have gotten a much more in-depth conversation with many more points of view. Like, this episode was released in 2008, which was kind of a weird gray area 
in the history of gay rights. Like, technically, homosexuality was still a political issue. As I guess it still is today. But I feel like public perception had shifted enough that you couldn't really have your character be against it without seeming like a total asshole. Uh, like, I think maybe you could have had someone say that marriage is between a man and a woman at this point and still be likable, but even then, only if they were very religious and only if they eventually came around. That said, though, things still weren't so far along that you could have just accepted it as a given that these characters that you liked and spent a lot of time with weren't homophobic jerks. Everyone here is very cool with Angela coming out as bi, but there is still also this weird undercurrent where it's cool that they're cool with it. If that makes sense. This all kind of comes to a head when Angela asks Booth his feelings on her past relationship, because... Well, if there were going to be a homophobic in this group, it would definitely be Booth. So does it freak you out? What? You know, that Roxy and I were a couple. You know, I don't know if asking if it freaks him out is really the right question there, because... Well, even if this was a less enlightened time, I don't know that there has ever been a straight man in history who is truly freaked out at the idea of two gorgeous women being together sexually. Still, to Booth's credit, he is very accepting. Although, again, since it's 2008, they still have to justify why he's accepting, so he ends up going on a long speech about how he had a gay aunt. My Aunt Ruth had a roommate, okay? She was my favorite aunt. She and Franny, they take me to the ballpark, to the movies, and I heard talk when I was a kid. Beat up my friend Pete because of it, then found out it was true. And? I already said she was my favorite aunt. And Franny, well, you know, she had box seats for the Phillies games. I mean, <laughs> come on, it doesn't get any better than that, right? Right. And like, don't get me wrong, that's all very sweet, and I'm sure it meant a lot to a very specific brand of queer person back in the day, but... Watching it in 2016, or whatever the fuck year it currently is, I find it very funny that they needed that justification at all. And it's moments like this that remind me that Bones is kind of a time capsule. I don't generally think of 2008 as being all that different from now, but apparently it was, because... Well, now... I don't think you would ever need to have lines of dialogue like this. I mean, come on, you had feelings for somebody. I'm surprised. Why? Because you think I'm some kind of lunkhead cop? Why is she surprised? This dude is one of her closest friends. I guess that it's possible that I don't know all of my friends' opinions on gay rights, but if I forged a friendship with them, it means that I'm at least assuming they're pro. Not, not sure I'd really be willing to put in the time with someone if I'm secretly thinking, like, yeah, that guy's probably a bigot, but I don't know, I guess that's just a sign of progress. Although in Angela's defense, I get why she may have thought that Booth would have been uncomfortable with her relationship, because, well, he's very clearly uncomfortable with her relationship. Like, even when he's giving her his straight guy seal of approval, he does it in a way that very much feels like the verbal equivalent of not making eye contact. So, you and Roxy, hey, you know what I mean? Yeah. He also refers to Roxy as Angela's friend in a way that feels fairly pointed. All right, so I got a dead artist and a forger who hates him. That's gotta cheer you up. I mean, your friend is no longer our prime suspect. Which, yeah, as if this budding relationship wasn't complicated enough. What with it being between two women and all, things are made even more so by the fact that one of those women may be a murderer. Bones and Booth go to interview a former art rival of Jeffrey the Car Corpse, and he informs them that Roxy stands to inherit the entirety of the deceased's estate, meaning that for the bulk of the episode, she's the prime suspect. 
And rather than just waiting to see how things pan out, Angela instead decides to go full steam ahead with rekindling a relationship with somebody who may have possibly used industrial machinery to crush her boss into a sedan. Like I said, this episode is all about her quest to get back out there after her engagement, and I guess she's just really motivated. Which, like, on top of being a bad decision for Angela on a personal level, pursuing a woman being investigated for murder also feels like a bad decision on a professional level, because lest you forget, Angela is one of the people investigating her. Like, I feel like if I were a judge, I would have instantly thrown out any findings Angela may have made the second I found out that this interaction occurred. I don't know, is it too sappy to say that you were my muse? <laughs> or perhaps my entire source of self-confidence as an artist? Your people think I killed Jeffrey. I can't talk to you about an ongoing murder investigation. If you can't prove it was a suicide, I'm going to spend the rest of my life being Jeffrey Thorne's murderer. And hell, even if she didn't go to Roxy's gallery to aggressively flirt with her, the two of them have enough of a history that Angela sitting this one out just kind of feels like the ethical thing to do. Like, I feel like the general rule of thumb in a murder investigation should be that no one on the team doing the investigating has ever posed nude for one of the suspects. Roxy. <laughs> Yeah, that's actually the first piece that caught Helen's eye. She wanted to buy it from me for herself. Why didn't you sell this? Something's up for sale. Of course, not to repeat myself, but this is Bones where professional ethics go to die. So Angela spends the entire show trying to think of ways to clear her once and future lover. And it's actually while she's staring at that portrait that she figures out a way to do so. I remember sitting for this. Yeah. Happiest time of my life. Oh my God. Oh my God. I have to go. Bye. I know how to prove that Jeffrey Thorne committed suicide. This type of device can be used to scan box cars, shipping containers, anything metal where items can be hidden. Okay, the show treats this like some amazing breakthrough that Angela has, but to me, using the car size scanning machine that they apparently always had access to is less of an idea and more of just the thing that they should have been doing from the beginning. Which is not to say that what Angela does with the x-rays isn't brilliant, because like I said, despite the fact that she's technically only there to do facial reconstructions, she is one of the greatest scientific minds of all time. Here we have our car, right? It had a low carbon steel frame with a yield strength of 22,450 PSI. So since I know the hydraulic crusher imparts 163 tons of force, first horizontally, then in a 32 degree curling motion, I was able to verify the source of every single ripple on the surface of the crush car, which then gave me the data to play the crushing backwards. How'd you do that? See what I mean? It's basically magic. Also, for those wondering, yes, they do have holograms. Unfortunately for Angela, though she performed that witchcraft to prove that the artist did this to himself and try to clear Roxy's name, she actually ends up proving that this was all a murder by revealing an unaccounted for wound in the back of the skull. Once Angela proves homicide, the judge removes the injunction, allowing them to cut into the sculpture. But unfortunately, finally being able to examine the body doesn't solve all of Bones' problems. Careful. Okay. Now what we want to do here is remove the skull very carefully. Carefully. And this all leads to the C story of the episode, which is... Well, it's basically just about the fact that everyone hates Daisy. 
Throughout the entire episode, the show does everything it can to portray her as unbearably annoying, even though the bulk of what she does is basically just stuff like this. This type of device can be used to scan boxcars, shipping containers, anything metal where items can be hidden. Amazing it is, this machine you have. Star Wars? Use doesn't excuse everything, Miss Wick. Burn her? And like, look, I'll admit that her crushing that skull isn't great, but I feel like it's more not great because she destroyed human remains. So it's weird to me that the show portrays it as more like irksome. I'm so sorry. I'll put it together. I will stay up all night. I'll do it. Well, I will assist you every step of the way. I will not leave your side. I would prefer to do it alone. Eventually, Daisy's annoyingness becomes a big enough issue that Saroyan goes to Sweets to ask him for advice. Thank you so much for seeing me. I didn't agree to see you. How come none of you people ever book an appointment? Frankly, it's annoying. And like, again, I really feel like he shouldn't be treating these people because they are his direct co-workers. It really feels like it violates all sorts of ethical standards. And even if I'm wrong and coworker on coworker therapy is a thing, then I feel like they still shouldn't be talking about the sort of shit that Sweets and Saroyan talk about here. It's Daisy Wick. Daisy? Yes, she's very smart, very able, and she has a knack for turning reasonable people into flaming gas balls of fury. You want me to talk to her? No, no. I need your advice on how to tell Daisy we can't have her at the lab anymore. Even if he weren't bound by HIPAA laws, I feel like the right thing for Sweets to do here would have been to say, like, I'm too intimately acquainted with everyone in this situation to give objective advice, particularly for reasons that I'll go into a little bit later. Instead, he does this. I'll do it. What? Really? Yeah, I'll talk to her. I'll as the boss, it's kind of my job to fire people. And as a boss, you know that sometimes it's better to delegate. All right, I don't even think that one's legal. He has absolutely no authority over Daisy in any way. So. Also, I don't super get why Saroyan even needed advice here. Like, sure, it would be awkward to tell someone they were fired just because everyone thought they were annoying, but... I don't think that's what's actually going on here. For all intents and purposes, Daisy did just desecrate a corpse and hinder a murder investigation, so... I don't know, maybe the rules are a little bit different in a forensics lab, but that feels like pretty good grounds for termination to me. Although I guess in Daisy's defense, her destroying that dude's skull isn't all that much of a setback as far as the case is concerned. Bones is able to put it back together so easily that... She's able to have a conversation with Angela about her love life while she does it. Nearly done. I honestly didn't think it would be murder. Which makes your conclusions all the more credible. <laughs> Only you would find that comforting. Booth is questioning DeLuca again. He seems to have a motive. So there's still a chance that your friend is not a murderer? Yeah. We'll know more when we identify the murder weapon. It wasn't Roxy. Do you still have feelings for her? No. <laughs> Booth tells me that sometimes people say the exact opposite of what they mean. Okay, I know that no matter what I say, I'm still going to get angry comments for diagnosing a character without any medical expertise. But like... I truly would not have said anything unless I was absolutely sure. Also, why is she still putting it back together? I mean, I guess maybe it's just a respect thing because that was someone's head once, but you can very clearly see that the wound that Bones wants to investigate has already been reconstructed, so I don't know why she waits until this one final piece in order to solve the case. On the bright side, if she did kill Jeffrey Thorne, you won't have to think about any of that. Thanks, Brennan. 
How long is it going to take you to identify the weapon? I can do it right now. I've seen this injury many times. I'm almost certain that the death blow came from a common fire axe. Once she identifies cause of death, it's not long before Bones figures out that the murderer was Kimono Lady, which... Well, in hindsight, feels pretty obvious. Sir, look at this. Is that my fire axe? Yes. Kimono Lady is arrested, Roxy is cleared, and she and Angela get together for what I imagine was Sweeps Week. And yeah, that's pretty much the episode. Outside of that, the only other thing that happens is that Sweets fires Daisy. Although that kind of makes it sound like it's a small thing, when in reality, it may very well be the craziest thing that happens this week. The entire Bones team gathers around to watch like they're at the Coliseum, which right off the bat feels like bad decorum for a firing situation. But then Sweets goes up to Daisy and does this. I've got some good news and some bad news. Which would you like first? The bad news. You're toast here. Nobody wants to work with you. Why? You know why, Daisy. There's some things that you have to work on when it comes to interpersonal relations. Does anybody like me? No, I'm afraid not. What's the good news? There's absolutely no reason for us to be discreet about a relationship anymore. That's right. Sweets and Daisy are dating. They've been keeping it a secret because I guess that this is the one time that anyone in this office has decided to show any amount of discretion, but now that she's fired, they're free to be together. And the more I think about this, the more about it I have to say, because like, there's a lot to unpack here. First and foremost, if Sweets really does like Daisy, then couldn't he have softened that blow a little bit more than he did? Like... Not gonna lie, if I was dating a person and they expected me to assume that the reason I was being fired is because I'm so annoying, I probably wouldn't want to keep dating that person much longer. Secondly, if you were concerned enough about dating your coworker that you kept the relationship a secret, then I'm not sure that firing that coworker to preserve the relationship is really the way to go because... I don't know, that feels like the way bigger HR violation to me. Also, bold of Sweets to assume that them getting to be together openly would make up for the fact that she's being fired, because like, this is a highly specialized internship at an extremely prestigious institution. She, she may have wanted to choose her career over you, dude. Especially because I don't really know how long this relationship can last. They're, not really starting out with the healthiest of dynamics. Really? Yeah, why would you ask me that? Because I thought we were being discreet because you're a little bit ashamed of me. You'd think that as a mental health professional, Sweets would know that someone who is willing to date a person they thought was too ashamed of them to be public about their relationship probably needs to work on themselves a little bit first, but... Whatever, I think that this is supposed to be a happy ending, so they kiss by the corpse inspecting table, and all their co-workers watch them, and... Yeah, that's Bones. And that's also the video, so thank you guys so much for watching. Please like and subscribe and share and comment and share again, because that really helps. I don't know, maybe there's like a Bones Reddit that would enjoy this, or maybe not. They probably... They're probably like, this guy doesn't know bones. I don't know. Um, and if you can, please subscribe to my Patreon because that really helps out. But uh, yeah, that's it. Thanks for watching. Bones. Welcome back, real fans. It's time for everyone's favorite part of my videos. The part that I spent the least amount of time and effort on. So uh, what I'm going to do is pose for a thumbnail while my patrons' names scroll as a thank you for being patrons. And um, yeah, for this one, I think I'm probably going to focus on the bisexuality. I think I'm going to say, call it like the time bones tackled bisexuality because I feel like knowing the internet, that's going to get the most um, attention. And uh, so I feel like... I guess maybe just like a little confused because they didn't handle it all that well. They handled it pretty well. I don't know. I'm being hard on bones, but um, uh, yeah. So like.
Hmm. Hmm. Two girls, you say? Shocking. Bones? She likes, she, she was just engaged to a boy. This can't be. I don't know why I'm reacting to bisexuality. I feel like in the thumbnail, I will be reacting to bones. Um, I really would, I feel like I would have 10 times as many subscribers if I could just lift up my fucking eyebrow, but I can't like, that's why The Rock is so popular. That's what separates me from The Rock. Bones, you say? This one seems nice, although I feel like the hand is gonna be hard to Photoshop out. I have a green screen. I don't know why I don't pose in front of my green screen. It's like right, right here. And I, I, I set it up so that it, it's, it's not behind where I sit, which is really stupid in hindsight. But um, I should probably use that more. Whatever, bones. I hope Roxy didn't do it. And then just like, hee 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 hee, because it's two girls kissing. I don't know, dudes and dudettes and dude theys. Whatever, I'm gonna go. Goodbye, thanks for watching.